Hello. You frequently come across headlines these days about how the markets are very volatile, thanks to the Europeans and the Americans. We've not really had a steady run-up in quite some time. But the question that you as an investor need to ask yourself is, should you even be paying attention to the broad market outlook? Should you be looking at stock specifics instead? Song Seng Woon is here with me. He's uh, the Executive Director and Regional Economist at CIMB Research. Long title. Thank you very much <laughs> for coming call in, Song. Song. Just call you Song. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you know, mm. one of the things that as an investor you really need to focus on is what stocks you invest Indeed. in. But a lot of people get sidetracked with these broad market outlooks, mm. these general discussions about how the market is going. Is that a help or a hindrance to investing? It is useful to know the operating environment that the company that you're thinking of investing in is working in. So that's where we look at um, the macro picture itself. You know, is the environment conducive to the company maintaining the in in income growth or margins, etc. as well. So yes, to some extent, looking at the broad picture would be useful because if you just look at a company, you might not know that the environment that they are in is getting tougher and tougher because consumers are more reluctant to spend or the central bank is tightening liquidity that makes it tougher for companies to have access mm. to liquidity, etc. as well. But what you've just de mm. uh, described is economics rather mm. than the market outlook, which sometimes also don't move in tandem, right? It's quite true. You know, in the market itself, you do have short-term factors because for markets, share price always and underlying always moved up when there's plenty of liquidity, i.e., you know, the more money, you know, uh, government or uh, central bank throw into the market, the more it feeds on, say, the stock prices itself. If you soak up those liquidity, market will find it tougher to operate in. So that's kind of a market condition, but obviously that will obviously depend on the overall macro landscape in which is it the environment where the government or the central bank would want to put more liquidity in the, in, into the banking system, into the financial system, or not itself? So in that sense, they are related. Okay, so in mm. other words, it is part of the decision-making process, but not the only not thing. Entirely. So no. let's look at the market then, mm. and just to get that background. And what do you see when you look at the Straits Times Index? I've got a couple of charts yeah, here yeah. for you. Let's look at these. Mm. The first one is the two-year chart. Mm. And what you see here is that the market has actually had quite a nice mm. little run-up uh, since May, and we are now at levels not seen since July. And mm. let's switch to the 20-year chart. That's right, the 20 year chart. And what that shows you is that if the market was to surpass around 3,200, we would be at five year highs. So, with that in mind, does that create the conducive environment that you're talking about? Yes, uh, put it simply, because at the end of the day, you're talking about, say, you know, Singapore, for those Singapore focused companies, it's only a small handful of those these days, because most of them are very regional now. So coming back to the Singapore environment, you see that Singapore economy generally has been growing at a steady pace. Yes, there's the odd bumps here and there, which is why if you look at the market indices itself, you know, it follows those periods when you have huge market volatility because of, say, SARS, because of you know, the dot-com bubble burst, or the Lehman crisis, for instance. So those cause the extreme you know, swing in the market. But if we look through it all, the macro environment is such that the economy continued to grow at a steady pace. If you look at the last, say, seven years, you talk seven, or seven to ten years, the economy is still growing around, say, six or seven percent through it all itself. So that supports the kind of a steady growth that we're seeing in the, in the broader SDI itself. In mm. the shorter frame, again, you have an external factor that drives market sentiment when there's a little bit of uncertainty on confidence on the market side. If you look back the last couple of years, it would be the Greek financial crisis or in a broader context, European debt crisis, which create uncertainty about whether companies are going to be around or not because if they might be you know, uh, in the euro market itself. So that's the kind of picture that we see that drive near-term volatility. But further out, if Singapore expands at a steady pace, you've got opportunity for the company to operate in. If you look outside of Singapore, which many of the uh, Singapore, sorry, SDI listed company are, it will be Singapore plus, plus the regional prospect, Malaysia, Indonesia, ASEAN, or Asian as the block itself. So far, they have been doing at a fairly steady growth in that mm. sense. And that, I think, supports the kind of a steady earnings that we are seeing underpinning the uh, stocks that are listed in, hmm. in the SDI itself. So in short, mm. still a conducive environment? So far, still good because uh, the bottom line here is all these earnings can only be supported by people, you and I, spending. We only spend if we know that there are people walking through the door that you know, spend and we earn some money in our pocket 
that allows us to spend. We have job security. We know that our friends or our children will get employed further down the road when they graduated, etc. as well. So if that's the, the assumption that you have at the back of your ground, at the back of your mind, that Singapore is the only economy that generates job opportunity, income growth, same situation around the region, then you say, haha, the company that operates there must therefore at least enjoy steady growth. So you look at the companies that participate in the growth that they're seeing around the region, mm. not just today, tomorrow, but you know, with a medium-term frame. And those that minimize mm. execution risk, I guess that's the other Indeed, thing. Indeed, you, know, you have, must have faith in the board that runs those companies uh, and have certain confidence that that board will continue to deliver uh, the plan of you know, enhancing value to the companies. Yes. It's important. Before we get on to the next mm. point, uh, just back to that 20-year chart, because mm. it's actually very interesting to look back on the history of the Straits Times Index. Uh, and by the way, it's not quite 20 years. It's back to 1999, mm. which when, if I recall correctly, that's when the Straits Times Industrial oh, Index became the Straits Times Index. Um, and what five to 40, you know, those uh, number of stocks. Of companies in there, yeah. Right, and, the, mm. and of course FTSE then took over a few years yeah, ago and, uh, yeah, and yeah. it was uh, 30 stocks there on. Mm. But I guess what's, what's interesting about this chart is that those things you talked about, you mentioned SARS just now. Yeah, Look at this. This is where SARS is. 2003, 2003 yeah. which um, these days just looks like a blip, Indeed, doesn't yeah. it? And yeah. same with the war in Iraq, the dot-com bubble bursting, yeah. September 11, we yeah. see that there. The uh, Lehman Brothers the crisis, crisis there in yeah. 2008 was somewhat worse, indeed. Uh, big falls, but we've made up a lot of that. Which brings me to my question, mm. Song, and that is whether we've now seen a lot of the market run up having been and gone already. In other words, that if you're still waiting for the economy to recover, you've kind of missed the boat. Uh, yes and no, because if we, again we look back uh, on the, on the cycles of the market itself, you know, well, you and I have been around for a long, long time now. The, the me even longer than you. Yeah, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> the, the cycle that we ex experienced before, say, 2008, typically around 10 years. So we almost get with predictable sort of a outcome that the cycle of 10 years you know, between boom and bust. But since 2008, since the Lehman one, we have suddenly seen it compress a lot more. Maybe it's just because the global economy is overgeared that you know companies, it's or, or, or economies are finding it a little bit more tougher to to, I suppose, clear their indigestion to some extent. Mm -hmm. So cycles now, two years, three years, of late, it seems to be every 15 months or so, thanks to the European uh, debt crisis or, you know, or wars yes. or whatever. So but I won't let you get away with not answering my question, and that is whether <laughs> it's too late to get in on the market now. No, because it com it's really tied to what we were going to discuss in terms of the being, because the cycle is a lot more shorter now, you don't have to wait for the 10-year cycle in that last time, you know, it will have a run out and say, oh no, we probably have to wait for the next cycle, down tip, to buy when things are cheaper, so mm -hmm. to say, because you have missed the boat. Now, because the cycle is so much more smaller and compressed, you say, okay, don't worry, if I had missed the boat one and a half years ago, maybe another cycle is coming because it's shorter, and I will be looking at stocks which perhaps I can enter, which previously I would have to wait for a longer period. So I would say no, but it just basically means that you have more volatility at this point, which makes it a lot more tougher and challenging uh, to pick stocks at this juncture. Mm. Mm. Finally, Song, you've been around for many, many years. Lots of so people long. know you. I've walked with you through Raffles Place one time, and virtually Indeed. every five steps you were saying hello to somebody. <laughs> Does it get easier? having been around in the market, the local market, for so long? <sighs> no, actually it's tougher now, mainly because the cycle has been a lot more compressed, which basically means, therefore, that you have to look at more things uh, to see whether you know, the, the next cycle is, is upon us uh, again. So this is where, again, talking to a lot of people helps in terms of whether they are spending, whether they are seeing signs of slowdown because their hiring plan has been put on hold, their investment capex spending has been put on hold. All these, I think, creates uncertainty in the mind, not just on the consumer side, but on the company level uh, as well, because they can be caught out if the swing suddenly turns up or suddenly turns down. But I suppose, again, is at the end of the day, because the cycle is shorter, you can ride through uh, those kind of volatility as well. So that's the only thing I think I can say at this point. Does anything surprise you anymore? <sighs> to some extent, yes. You know, after the Asian financial crisis, we learned our lesson that you know, not to have a fixed exchange rate, to have you know a greater flows and flexibility in managing economy, dampen the volatility. But the European, which we thought you know, are the guys who wrote the textbook on Econ 101, 
would have at least realized that you can't just help the economy by just pumping the economy and helping the banks you know, uh, survive another day, that you need complementary fiscal policy together with monetary policy to stabilize uh, the, the situation itself. But it looks at this juncture, they still haven't learned that you can't do you know, a, so a, a clean out of the economy just by asking the banks and the financial system uh, to keep going without the fiscal side and the government ad intervening uh, to create opportunity for the recovery to begin. But arguably the Europeans don't have that mechanism. They don't have a broad fiscal control across Indeed. The so this is why I think it's, it's getting difficult and for uh, investors this is where the uncertainty comes in, in that because they don't have that flexibility on the fiscal side that it could potentially drag a difficult or a problem becomes even more tougher in the coming years primarily because you don't have the fiscal ability to deal with the mess. Before we let you mm. go then, um, in other words, it sounds like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Indeed. Um, <laughs> is there any um, simple help that you can give people watching who've perhaps, who are bamboozled by all of this talk okay. uh, to kind of get a head start? Basically, the simple thing is, you know, uh, if you like to get started in the stock market and so, end of the day, it's about investing in companies that give you the return because they make money selling stuff or doing things, and they can do so with a healthy margins, which at the end of the day is all about costs of wages, costs of renting, etc. And the top side is how much they can sell. All these can only take place if you and I spent. So in the Asia Pacific time zone, it's relatively easy. I think, as we said, people are employed, opportunity for employment is still good. That still happens itself. So what we do monitor, therefore, is order flows every month that comes out. If anyone wants to have a simple cheat sheet, it will be, are orders coming through? Take now as a good example, second half of the year. Typically, orders should be coming through for companies because they should be ramping out the output for the year and Christmas stockings, etc. as well. If orders are not coming through, that would suggest that business confidence, consumer confidence are somewhat you know, uh, uncertain at this point, which may mean that they are not going to be reporting the kind of earnings which typically one will be re associating companies with for the stronger half of this year, so we will be a bit more wary. So cheat sheet number one in terms of first thing on the floor is those monthly PMI numbers, monitor them closely. If they're up, they're good. If they're down, they're bad, as simple as they get. And then on the local ground itself, whether financial institutions are still supporting the lending. Here in Asia, China is the anchor economy, so we will look at China lending growth as an example, where if the banks continue to lend at a healthy clip, that's good. If they're starting to see lesser and smaller lending amount, we start to worry itself. Looking at the US side, it's still important. That's the largest economy in the world. If employment continues to gain at a healthy pace, I suppose healthy in the case of the US is just anything about zero, to mm -hmm. be honest. <laughs> if that's the case, at, at least that supports an anchor global economy. Europe is important because that's you know more, more than a third of global economy itself. That is a little bit more dodgy at this point. All we can say is we monitor the lending costs of, uh, you know, borrowing costs, sorry, uh, of uh, Spain, of Italy. These are the key economies that anchor at this moment sentiment uh, in Europe. If they continue to come off, at least we have bought ourselves a few more days or weeks. If they are not, we panic, market will be moving sideways again. So that's kind of a simple cheat sheet to round it, wrap it up, PMI numbers. Uh, for the region to see all the flows mm -hmm. uh, within the region itself. We look at China lending growth uh, within the US itself. We look at the employment numbers in Europe, just those uh, interest rate, um, whether they're going up or coming down. Thank you so much. It's uh, been great to have you with us. Song Seng Woon from CIMB Research. Singapore Investment Week, August 25th to 31st. Here is the URL, the website that you can go for further information. Thanks so much for watching.